Welcome back to Your Health Radio and Television Program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm so delighted you could be with us. And we're going to break the rules, and I'm going to keep Elizabeth Lily Hills on as a guest for, the, for this uh, remainder of the segment. And I'm going to try to hold up this poster that she was kind enough to bring. This is the author of the Body Love Manual. The subtitle is How to Love the Body You Have as You Create the Body You Want. Elizabeth Lily Hills. Well, now, do I get to call you Lily or should I call you Ms. Hills or Elizabeth? Or Please call me Lily. Lily. Okay. So I have lots of questions about this. You know, I, since I just heard about you and the book, as I told um, our audience in our prior segment, uh, my hair cutter was just so excited after going to your seminar. And so then I thought, let's contact this woman and get her on the program. So I haven't had a chance to read it, unfortunately, but I would love to because it's for men as well as women. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. So um, let's kind of start at the beginning. What gave you the idea to write a book called The Body Love Manual? How'd you come up with this? Well, um, the way that I came up with the title is in the book, I write about the fact that at one point when I was about 60 pounds heavier than I am now, I, want, I knew that there was wisdom in loving my body. I wanted to love my body, but I didn't know how. And I thought, oh my God, I wish I had a body love manual. <laughs> so I ended up writing the body love manual because people tell us all the time, love yourself, love your body, but they don't give you specific advice as to how to do that, how to counteract the old thoughts that have you thinking ill of your body, which is in fact the most incredible instrument on the planet. I mean, there are functions that the human body has that even the most brilliant scientists can't explain. So they are remarkable and amazing, but instead of appreciating them for what they can do, we judge them hard for how they look. And so when we're judging them, again, that makes us more prone to eat compulsively because we bring our mood down, and in order to elevate it, we try and eat food to make ourselves feel good again. Well, Lily, um, I heard you say that the idea for this kind of was conceived as you lost weight, I think yes. you said you lost 60 pounds yes. or over 60 pounds. Yeah. Well, well, so what was it that made you sort of come to a realization that you wanted to be thinner or be lighter? How'd that work for you? In other words, this book didn't come from you just giving other people advice and then and them giving you feedback and right. you giving them advice and them giving you feedback. This is part of your own experience. Yes. So how is it that you just came to the realization that you wanted to be lighter? Well. I was so uncomfortable in my body. I knew that the weight that I was living wasn't natural and healthy for me because the reason I gained so much weight is because I was eating compulsively. And that all started with my first diet, which I went on when I was uh, a senior in high school. And I was going on a big date, and I was excited for the date, and I, I was going to the beach. And I went to the store to get a bikini, a, a new bathing suit. And I was looking in the, in the mirrors of the dressing rooms, which is all we women, as we women know, are incredibly unforgiving and I looked at my body and I judged it I thought oh my thighs look a little bit too big I need to lose some weight so I left the store with the bathing suit a little depressed and I started on an all vegetable diet the next day and an I, all vegetable all diet. vegetable because I heard that's the fastest way to lose weight and I wanted to lose weight before my my big date so I started on this diet and the obsession with food that resulted from my telling myself I couldn't have something was, became extreme just within a couple days. I couldn't wait for the day to be over because I wanted to get back to eating again normally. And that started the compulsion. Diets create an unnatural obsession with food. That's one of the worst things about them. I say in the, in the book, do not diet. It is not, a, not an appropriate way to lose weight, not appropriate or effective, not only because it makes you more obsessed with food, but also because when you diet and you restrict your caloric intake, you're basically telling your body, you're going into starvation mode, kind of like it was for our early ancestors. And so you're depriving it of calories. So in order, to, in order to help you survive, or what it thinks is to help you to survive, it slows down your metabolism. And then when you go back to eating normally, your body will gain excess weight. It'll, it, you'll gain the weight back and then some just when you start to eat normally. So that's why I tell everybody, diets are the worst thing you can possibly do if you want to lose weight. So what I suggest instead is, if you start to listen to your body, the way, the, how I lost my 60 pounds is I learned how to start eating when I was physically hungry and stopped when I was satisfied. And if you know anyone who's naturally in great shape, they eat when they're hungry, and then when they've had enough, they say, I can have whatever I want to eat. Uh, I eat whatever I want. I don't deny myself any food. 
And I love eating now more than ever before because I don't have guilt around it. But part of that is because I allowed myself to eat anything. I didn't say you can't have ice cream or you can't have uh, pasta or you can't have pizza. I allowed myself every choice and that cured that voice in my head that would say, oh, you're bad for eating that. And then I'd end up eating more, which is what now two thirds of Americans are doing because our obesity rates are escalating and they say two thirds of us are either overweight or obese. Well, well Lily, I, I do want to get to that about y your own personal theory about why so many Americans are overweight. But I, but I have another question. How does one distinguish between an actual physical feeling of hunger that they really need or, and want food? And how do they distinguish between that and maybe their body or mind is playing a trick on them, that they're just uh -huh. nervous or stressed out or bothered by something else, and they might want to mask that uncomfortable feeling with sugar or some sensation, how, some other taste sensation? Now, is there a way for a person to tune in and distinguish between actual hunger and just trying to mask an uncomfortable feeling? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for many people, every body is a little bit different, so everyone has to tune into their own body to determine what their body signal is for hunger. But usually what ends up happening, when we're hungry, we're going to get a rumbling s sensation in our stomach. It's going to feel kind of empty. Some people report kind of a lightheaded feeling or a high. Some people get grumpy. Everybody, when they tune into their body, when they slow down, your body will tell you when it's hungry through a physical sensation. And you'll know when you're eating uh, out of compulsion rather than out of a physical sensation because there's usually a nervous energy that accompanies it. There's usually that kind of, um, there's a, almost a shallow feeling in the breath. There's a, a, there's a tense feeling, a tightening in the stomach as opposed to a rumbling. So if you breathe and you slow down and you tune into your body, that's the key, slowing down, as you had mentioned earlier in terms of the, the pace our society keeps. If you slow down and you tune into it, it's going to tell you when it's hungry, and it will also tell you what it's hungry for. It will guide you to the foods that are optimum for it. If I'm listening to my head, I'm usually going to want cake and pie and desserts and pizza and ice cream, and they're all fine. I can have those if I want to. But if, when I'm really listening to my body, it's guiding me towards protein-rich foods. It's guiding me towards fruits and vegetables, whereas before, all I wanted pretty much was sugar and carbohydrates. Now I like the full variety of foods. So once I allowed myself the, the possibility of eating every food, I was able to be guided by my body to the healthier choices naturally. Healthier choices, I love that phrase, healthier choices. It makes me, healthier choices, it makes me want to read the book just by, <laughs> just by hearing that phrase, healthier choices, I like that. Well, well Lily, um, we can barely pick up a newspaper or look at the television or listen to the radio these days and not hear something about how Americans are gaining weight, that 30% of Americans are considered uh, overweight, another 20% may be considered obese. And so do you have personal theories about how that has happened or how we've gotten to this point where so many Americans are too heavy? I, I think there are, there are quite a few factors. Um, one is definitely the food choices that we're taking in. Um, we're eating in a very fast-paced way. Usually when we eat our food, we're not lingering over the meals like they do in Europe. We're not drawing them out like a wonderful conversation. We're racing through our meal in order to get on to the next thing. So part of it is not just what we're choosing to eat, it's how fast we're choosing to eat it. We're eating in front of the television. I actually think that a lot of the ob obesity in our country is related to eating in front of the television because we're not connected with our body, which might be saying, I've had enough. And then we're watching TV and it's so fascinating and so fun, right? Television can be very entertaining that we're disconnected from our body. And then I can remember eating entire meals in front of the television set and literally wondering where it went because I wasn't connected. I was, I was multitasking. So multitasking eating, I think, is in large part responsible. I think part of it is the fact that we're spending a lot of time indoors. We've become an indoor society. And if we're not spending time outdoors, it's very easy to get depressed. And again, we're going to turn to something to make us feel better or to crowd out the difficult emotions, the tension or the sense of inadequacy that makes us want to grab food when we're not hungry. So I believe that you know we're really not taught, most of us from an early age, that we are special and extraordinary just by virtue of the fact that we're human beings, right? I mean, we're the only planet in our galaxy or any of the known galaxies that, that has human life on it. And so we're very sacred and special, but we don't hold ourselves that way. And oftentimes we don't hold other people that way, which is why 
in some ways we've become a society that resorts to violence as opposed to verbal communications to work out our issues. Wow, Lily, that's fascinating. Uh, I've been learning myself about something called peaceful eating. I have a friend who's a doctor, acupuncturist in Santa Cruz, Donna Light, and she's been teaching me about what's called peaceful eating. And even if it's, it could be saying grace before a meal or, or having a moment of silence or just a moment of reflection to just center and concentrate and relax on the food that we're about to enjoy. And I think, you know, I contrast that to what you're saying and seeing how Americans may grab a sandwich on the run and eat in the car or eat on the bus or the subway. And I think it's just totally, totally opposite about the way we want to go, which is I think towards peaceful eating and to what you're saying about relaxing, right? Yeah. And enjoying each, each bite of the food. Each bite of the food. Thich Nhat Hanh always says that greet your food. He says, you say hello to your carrot, which is actually very cute. And, and some of my friends said, well, that's crazy. And I said, well, what's crazier? Being present to your meal and even being a little kooky around it, but present or eating compulsively be and being unhappy. You know, I'd rather take a minute to acknowledge the food and be present to it and be present to the conversation and again, draw it out like a long, lovely conversation. Then you feel satiated. Some of the people that I work with who have compulsive eating issues say that once they start eating in sync with their body, they're almost disappointed at how quickly they're full. Once they're really connected to their meal, they go, you know, it used to be that I, you know, I could eat for a long time, but now I'll eat and I'll be satisfied so much more quickly. But the, the, the connection with their body, our stomachs are actually about the size of our fist. So that's about how much food it takes. So a man, yours is gonna be a larger, a little larger. So if we're eating in sync with our bodies, we are satisfied much more quickly. The portions here in the United States are also gargantuan and we think, well, this is how much food we should be eating. But our bodies need, our bodies operate optimally on smaller portions more frequently. Um. Lily, I, let me change direction for just a moment. I'm one of those Americans, one of those, I think, guys or gal, you can say gals, I could say gals too. Absolutely. I, I love <laughs> to sweat and go to the gym or work out, and I feel like I'm releasing toxins and sweating out toxins, emotional or physical toxins. Now, do you think that exercise plays an important role in maintaining a proper weight, or you don't think it's that important, or it's I imperative? What do you think about that? I think that? it's vital. I think it's vital. I think that... The studies show that exercise is as important as what we eat to being healthy. And I think part of that is because when we exercise, we do release endorphins. It makes us happier by nature. Oftentimes we're getting outside to exercise, so you're getting a double rush for your buck. If I'm outside and I'm exercising, I'm more joyous because I'm outside, I'm connecting with Mother Nature, there's so many beautiful things to look at, and I'm getting my heart rate up, I'm perspiring, I'm getting my uh, joy factor up to higher and higher degrees just by being outside. But exercise also allows us to breathe more deeply, which is, creates a relaxation response in our body and gives us that feeling of well-being. And part of what I talk about in the book is how important it is to breathe before you put something in your body, to center yourself. Because when I'm centered and I'm making choices, I'll make them very differently. And so it gets you to breathe more deeply and that allows us to relax. And when we're relaxed, we also make smarter choices in, in, on every level, in terms of how we're living our lives, in terms of what we're putting in our bodies. And so it's just smart to slow down and breathe. And when we're tense, we breathe from up here, we breathe from our chest. But when we are breathing from our diaphragm and we're breathing fully, again, we relax and we get the same feeling through breathing that we're looking for through food. Lily, joy factor. That's another phrase that caught my attention <laughs> along with healthy choices, joy factor. See, these are all going in the journal. <laughs> um, you, you're, deli you're delightful. Now, Lily, I want to ask you a question. Now, I don't want my producer to censor me, you know, but I want to ask you a question that my hair cutter, Leia, mentioned to me. Now, I, I can't, I wasn't at the seminar, so I can't uh, totally describe what went on, but she mentioned that you have an idea that sex and romance can actually improve if someone is happy with their weight or, or if someone is at more of their ideal weight. Now, is that, is that true? Do you feel that sex and romance can actually improve when someone's at their ideal weight or at the weight they're, they're comfortable with? Absolutely, because I think part of the reason that we are disconnected from our sensuality is because so many women are judging their bodies so harshly and they don't realize that every single body is beautiful in its own way. They all look different. I, I, I say to women, each of us is like a different flower. 
Don't compare your beauty to anyone else's because that's another low vibration thought that's only going to make you depressed. When we love and appreciate our body, it brings out our sexual and sensual side and makes us more present to our partner. So, but when we're judging ourselves, we feel ashamed and that absolutely shuts down our sensuality. Well, Lily, do you think it's true that women are more critical and harder on themselves than men are on themselves? Do you think that's true? Or do you think men are hard on themselves as well? That's a very good question. I think that when it comes to how we look, women are hard on themselves. Men tend to be harder on themselves for what they possess or what they're achieving in their lives. They tend to be a little bit more hard on themselves. And I think that there is a growing escalation of men really judging themselves for how they look and how they appear. But for us women, because of the beauty magazines and the beauty industry and so many examples of women that are really, really thin and airbrushed to perfection, we think that's what we have to look like in order to be beautiful. And the truth is, I don't think men are nearly as particular about that as women are. Men like us to be joyous and happy and fun and, and connected and all of those things. It really isn't they like us to be attractive and to feel good about ourselves. That's attractive. Lily, I, I think I'm going to just, I'm, I'm going to get you to give some seminars. <laughs> this, um, and I want everybody I know to attend. Now, we only have about a minute. So what I'm going to do is hold this up, and then I'm going to ask you a final question, okay? okay? So this is, the book is called The Body Love, see that? I've got to zoom in, or The Body Love Manual, How to Love the Body You Have as You Create the Body You Want by Elizabeth Lily Hills. Now, I've got... Uh, in the last minute we have, I want to know how people can find out more about your book or how they can get a copy. And if we have time, give us one tip uh, that someone can minimize their chances of overeating, say okay. stressful eating. So how do they find out about your book or get a copy? Uh, the best way is to go onto my website. It's thebodylovemanual.com. Okay, thebodylovemanual.com. Yes. Spell out each word and it's all one word. It's all one word. Okay, yes. perfect. Elizabeth Lily Hills thebodylovemanual.com. Now we have like 20 seconds. Okay. Can you give us one tip? Uh, what if someone feels that they're stressed or they're starting to use food to take care of that stress? Well, any piece, any advice? There's so many things, but I would say the first thing to turn to is to breathe deeply and to say something gracious and kind to yourself because that's the fastest way to switch your mood is to be kind to yourself. It brings out the best in who you are. It reduces your stress levels and it makes you the best person you can possibly be. So I'm, that is my message. The kinder you are to yourself, the better person you are. Lily, you are just one big bundle of positive energy. <laughs> so thank you for coming on the program. Thank you so much and, for having um, me. I hope you, let's try to make time and come on again. Okay? I'd love to, I would absolutely El love to. Elizabeth Lily Hills, The Body Love Manual. I'm Dr. David Morwood, and this is your health radio and television program. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon, and we're going to kind of, we are going to come right back after a very brief pause for a very good cause. Thanks for being here.